Get ready for your weekly dose of pixie dust with Disney Coast to Coast. Hey folks, and welcome to Disney Coast to Coast, the ultimate unofficial Disney fan podcast. I'm Jeff DePauly, and on today's show, I have part one of an exclusive interview with Disney legend Floyd Norman. Floyd began his career at Walt Disney Animation Studios at a young age and has had a lot of ups and downs along the way. In part one of this interview, you'll hear him discuss his training under Walt's Nine Old Men, his work on Sleeping Beauty and The Jungle Book, the introduction of Xerography and 101 Dalmatians, and much more. Let's get to that conversation right now. Floyd, thank you so much for coming on Disney Coast to Coast. You are the busiest and most stylish retired man I've ever met in my entire life. Oh, I like that. Stylish. That's pretty good. I like stylish. Every time I see you. In fact, <laughs> I just saw you this past weekend at Don Hahn's art exhibit. Yeah. I didn't bother you because you were... Busy talking to everybody. Oh, no, no. Bother me anytime. I like, I like being bothered. <laughs> well, that's why you're on the yeah. show, because I bothered you at Walt's Barn. Good, And good. Uh, it, Actually, like when I say you're busy, I'm not kidding in the least. It's It's been a year Yeah, we've been trying to schedule this. <laughs> and every time you're like, oh, next month should be fine. And then, mo- then a month comes along, you're like, I'm working the Oscars now or whatever. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> it's just, it's unbelievable. Yeah. I mean, can I say your age? Sure, sure. The, uh, in a couple of weeks, by the time that this is, is released, you will be 84 years old. I'll be officially an old man. Uh, in, but <laughs> let me... Yeah. I mean, there's nothing old about you when it comes to your presence and the way you move and the, the energy you have and stuff. It's, it's, it's unbelievable. Trying hard to avoid old age. Well, I think part of it is you do what you love. Yeah. And that started at a very young age for you. And I am kind of curious, obviously you've done tons of animation stuff, but when did that innate desire start for you? Was it very obvious from a young age? Yeah. You know, it was really, I mean, I often go back to my middle school days because, uh, I think it's when I was in middle school that I fell in love with the entertainment business. Now, keep in mind, we were just kids growing up, going to school, like, you know, normal kids anywhere. In Santa Barbara. In Santa Barbara, Santa Barbara, California. And uh, my uh, middle school, Santa Barbara Junior High School, used to put on class plays. And I'm sure this is done all over the country. But I remember one Saturday evening when we had... I don't know what the play was, but we had music and singing and we had an orchestra and we had lighting and curtains and just, it was magical. And I said, I don't know what this is, but it's show business. And this is what I want to do for the rest of my life. So it was the magic of showbiz that I fell in love with. Not just animation. Animation was a part of it, but it was just the world of entertainment. And I knew where that was. It was in Hollywood. So I said, when I finish school, I'm headed for Hollywood. Okay, so it wasn't necessarily animation. So I'm curious, if you didn't end up in that animation world, what area do you think you would have ended up in? Oh, yeah, I would have ended up in some area of show business because I, I, I fell in love with all of it. Um, the uh, the musical component, I, I played in the school band, band and orchestra when I was a kid. Oh, what'd you play? Uh, badly. I played the violin. Oh, cool. Terrible. I was a terrible violin player. I played the clarinet, the saxophone, and the flute. I played saxophone as well. Very good. Nice. See, saxophone's a little bit easier. Yeah. You don't have to be a master in order to get by. So I love music and um, I had great music teachers when I was going to school in Santa Barbara. Uh, Irvin McGuire, my music teacher in junior high school. Henry Brubeck, my, my music teacher in high school, the brother of jazz legend Dave Brubeck. Uh, so, I, I mean, here I was uh, surrounded by all of this talent, uh, and we had film composers who wrote, who scored motion pictures, and they lived in Santa Barbara. So being around showbiz folks for me and for all of us kids was just normal. It wasn't unusual. It was, it was just our way of life in Santa Barbara, California. So when you did start drawing, I am kind of curious. Like for me personally, when it comes to like great animators and cartoonists and such, mm-hmm. there's something innate there. Now, obviously, you train and you become better and such. Yeah. But do you agree with that sentiment, or do you feel like it's something that can be learned by you know most people? Well, I think most of us who draw for a living, uh, when we were kids, I mean, we were the crazy kids who never stopped drawing. 
you know, all kids start out drawing. I remember being in grade school and we were all had our little easels and, and our little, uh, sketch pads and, you know, and all the kids would draw and paint because that's what you do when you're a little kid. Those of us who never stopped drawing and painting, we were the crazy ones who were going to go on to become artists. And that was mainly because we had to. Uh, an artist draws not because he or she uh, wants to be, you know, wants to draw, but they have to draw. Yeah. It is a necessity. Yeah. Now, there is the this famous story. You hear this about a lot of people where, you know, they want to be in showbiz. Mm -hmm. They go visit the studio. They sneak on the lot or get on somehow. And there is yeah. a story about you that you went to the Walt Disney Studios in high school. Yeah. Had no, you know, access to the lot, but somehow convinced security to let you on. Curious, number one, if that's true. And number two, how you convinced them. No, no. I did have access to the lot because an appointment had been made. Okay. So we did go through proper channels, even though it was not a work day it was a saturday studio was closed except for you know a few people on the disney studio lot and a couple of people i think in the personnel department remember those days back when we had personnel instead of hr yeah exactly <laughs> and, and you could actually go talk to somebody as opposed to apply to everything online. yeah exactly <laughs> where you could actually have a one-on-one -on -one with a person who worked in the personnel department yeah so i i had a little portfolio Looking back on it, not very impressive, but little cartoon drawings. So I took my little portfolio to this personnel person at the Disney studio, and I said, well, you know, what do you think? These are my drawings. I'd like to work here one day. And they, they looked at my drawings and said, pretty good. You know, not bad. Uh, we're going to give you some good advice. Go to school. Learn how to become an artist. And I took that advice from Disney. And that's exactly what I did. I, I enrolled in art school, Art Center College of Design, at that time located in Los Angeles, California, over on 3rd Street, a four-year course. And I attended Art Center for at least three years before receiving a phone call from, you guessed it, the Walt Disney Studios. And had, wow, so you get a call from them. Had you like sent new stuff or had they just kept your stuff on file or how did that phone call come about? Apparently they kept my uh, phone number on file. Wow. Keep in mind, this was the days before, you know, the photocopy process, before Xerox. So they had no way of even copying my drawings. So th they didn't have any of my artwork on file. Wow. But they did keep my phone number because I had applied for a job. You know, uh, years earlier, this kid right out of high school comes and applies for a job at Disney, and they didn't throw my phone number away. You know, you would have expected your number would have been tossed in the, you know, in the trash can, but they kept it. Huh. So three years later, somebody found that phone number and uh, dialed the number. I answered the phone <laughs> while watching the Mickey Mouse Club on television. Uh, that's awesome. And Talk this was 1956, it. right? This was 1956. Okay, yeah. so you go work for the Walt Disney Company in 1956. I am curious, at this point, you know, a big focus for the company is Disneyland, or at least for Walt. You bet. Was Disneyland. And you went into the animation department. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious, you always hear that Walt was very focused on Disneyland when that came along. Did you feel that way in the studio, or did you feel like, no, he was still very much involved with animation at that point? Well, keep in mind, when you're a young kid, just sure. starting at the Walt Disney Studio, you are kind of just blown away. Yeah. The very fact that you're there is amazing. So I had no thoughts about what's Walt doing, what's his focus. Uh, heck, I was afraid of the nine old men. I wouldn't even speak to them. I was terrified. Because these guys were legendary. They were giants of animation. So they were even at that time. That's one thing. Oh, I was... yeah. Even at okay. that time, they were already legendary, at least for those of us who love this medium. Okay. Who love the world of animation. We knew who the, uh, you know, the legendary nine old men were. Okay, cool. We knew they were there. We didn't have the, the guts to walk up to them and meet them. Mm -hmm. But we knew they were around. We rarely saw them because we didn't venture into D-Wing. And so again, we came, we were just naive young kids, just starting our first, um, introduction to the world of animation. So we didn't, we didn't even see Walt Disney. I okay. Mean, we knew he was probably around somewhere, but we never had any, uh, expectation of meeting our heroes. You know, we were just trying to survive. You know, we were going through a training period, a 30 day training period to see whether or not we might even qualify 
for this, uh, what we considered this prestigious job. So we went through our 30 days of training, hoping that maybe after those 30 days, we might indeed have a job. I'm happy to say that all of us, every one of us made it. Wow. All of us who went through that training period, both. And there were uh, young women as well as young men. People think of animation back in those days as being, you know, the boys club. Oh, no, no. We had lots of young young women huh. who were there uh, vying for those same jobs as well. That's that's an interesting thing I'd never heard because you always just hear the women ended up at Ink and Paint. Yeah, Which yeah. was just this whole separate thing and only the women could do that. Right, But you're saying right. along with you, was this to do like be an assistant and be an in-betweener as well? The women were doing that stuff? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, wow. yeah. And it's sad to know that, that this story is passed along and people hear it again and again. Women were not given the opportunity to be artists at Disney. They were all restricted to the Ink and Paint building. Uh, you know, people speak of ink and paint as being sort of this animation ghetto. Uh, you know, only women work in ink and paint. Women cannot work any place else but in ink and paint. And that was not true. Uh, the reason women were in ink and paint, it was a out of necessity. Walt Disney found out that women were particularly adept at inking and painting cells. Hmm. Men could do it, but men would often... Uh, grow frustrated because it was a very tedious task, um, a very meticulous task. It would drive men crazy. Uh, even when you do it, and I've done it, I, I inked and painted cells myself. On what? Any, uh, of, the, any of the oh, only, features we know? Oh, no, no, shorts? only on my own little oh, okay. my own little cartoon films, just to show that I've been through the process. Yeah. Well, inking and painting is a very tedious job. And for some reason... And I do think that men and women are different. There are people who might argue with me. But women just, for some reason, can deal with that job of doing this mundane. And yet, even though it's a mundane job, it's it's a very important job. And it requires a particular skill set. A skill set that, for some reason, appears to be the domain of women, not men. Women were very good at doing this marvelous inking. Uh, I watched them do it at, at the Disney studio. Gorgeous, meticulous inking of uh, cell after cell and then painting those cells and not making mistakes. Men tend to be sloppy. Men tend to get bored with this uh, rather tedious job. But women were particularly good at it. And Walt Disney noticed that early on. And that's why he had women do uh, the job of inking and painting, not because women were put in this ink and paint ghetto, but it was because they were very good at doing that particular job. Huh. Yeah. And you started more as an in-betweener, right? You bet, yeah. So just for the folks who don't know, why don't you explain a bit what yeah. in-betweening is? Right. In-betweening is this weird job, and I thought I knew a thing or two about animation because I had studied it on my own long before coming to the Walt Disney Studio. But I arrived at the Walt Disney Studio not really having done an in-between in my life. Because <laughs> I really, we, well, I knew that animation was comprised of multiple drawings, you know, all moving in sequence. But I never realized that when you do an in-between, you literally put a drawing in between two other drawings. Now, it sounds simple, but it, it's also kind of crazy. Because I remember when I was handed my first in-between, and it was an in-between of Donald Duck. I remember that. I remember that day uh, specifically. I had two drawings of Donald Duck, two extremes. And I was told to put a drawing directly in the middle of those two other drawings of Donald Duck. And I thought, this is insane. <laughs> put a drawing in the middle of the other. And that means... Every line has to be exactly in the middle. It's got to be done perfectly. Because if it's not done properly, then it's going to jerk or bobble. It will not look, it won't look smooth on screen. That's why an in-between has to be perfectly in between the two extremes. You know, I, I honestly did not know that concept until I got to the Disney studio, nor did anybody else. We were all like, you know, sort of dumbfounded like, what? <laughs> An in-between? <laughs> How many drawings were typically needed 
for the in between from one pose to another that the original animator worked on. Oh, that can vary. Okay. It all depends on the animator's chart. Okay. And if you, back in the old days of hand drawn animation, uh, the animator's chart was always on the side of the uh, ex- the two extremes. They would tell you how many in betweens were going to go in between those two extremes. There could be one. There could be a dozen. Okay, wow. It all depends on the particular action the animator was going for. Hmm. So, uh, but then again, even when you broke it down and put more in betweens in between those drawings, sure. every drawing had to be perfectly in between the other two drawings. It sounds crazy, but you know, it's funny. As kids, we got it, we, we eventually caught on, and then you start to do it like it's second nature. Yeah. At first, it seems like mind bending, like, holy cow, how am I going to do this? Because it's not like drawing where you just do a drawing. No, you're doing a drawing in between two other drawings, which sounds crazy. But not only that, like for me, I I feel like even as difficult as getting that perfect movement in between is, you know, every artist or animator has their own style. Yeah. Yet you now have to draw somebody else's style as if it was your own. Yeah, you do not, you no longer have a style because uh, there cannot be any stylistic interpretation. Every drawing has to look exactly the same as every other drawing. No matter who works on it, whether it's five people or 25 people, every drawing looks the same. There has to be that consistency to make animation work. So was that kind of artistically frustrating for you? Or was it just like, no, this is a great learning process. Obviously, you're in-betweening for some amazing (laughs) artists. Well, you learn how to do it because you want the job. Okay. And you want to learn how to do this job. So you, you have no choice. And every now and then, there was a person who just could not could not do it, could not stand this crazy thing of doing in-betweens. And so they were the ones who moved on to do something else. You really had to have a kind of an animation brain to do this crazy, crazy job. Because it it was a unique job, yeah. It's very interesting to me because to me, like, I kind of – Think of it as a singer. There are a lot of beautiful singers out there yeah. who, who have great voices but aren't great at harmonizing. Mm-hmm. And because of that, it's like, okay, you can't do certain jobs because you're not great at harmonizing. Yeah. Yet you've got this stunning voice that, like, the world wants to hear. I, like, if you're not a good in-betweener, mm-hmm. are, you, are you eventually let go? Or is it kind of just one of those things like, okay, this is not a skill they have. Yeah. Let's put them here. I mean, I'm sure it's different case by case, but oh, I yeah. guess was it majorly looked down upon if you could not catch on to that process of in-betweening? I don't think anybody looked down on you. I think you, and and you would realize it too, that, well, maybe this job is just not for me. Okay. You know, uh, nothing to feel bad about. Maybe, maybe it's just not, it's a crazy job anyway. Maybe. But would you have a future at the studio, do you think? Or was it like, oh no, like, you oh, you mean, I mean in terms of finding yeah, another, like, so, another job? Yeah, so like if you couldn't in between, obviously that's like an entry level thing. It is. But you were a phenomenal character designer or something. Is that something that, you know, the higher ups would notice and say, okay, they might not be great at in between, but we really right. got to keep them around because their designs are incredible? Or was it more mm-hmm. like, no, this is really the process you need to go through. And if you can't learn this in between process, we're going to have to let you go. Yeah, pretty much uh, that. Even if you aspired to do other things at the Walt Disney Studio, you still had to get that job as an in-betweener in order to, you know, continue your career. Now, you may move into other areas. You might want to become a layout artist or a background painter. You might want to become a writer. You still had to land that job as an apprentice in-betweener just to get a foot in the door. Mm -hmm. It was your way in. It was indeed the entry-level job that got you into Disney. Once you were in... Then, if that wasn't your cup of tea, you could then look around and make a move in a a different direction. Okay. But you first had to score that job as an apprentice in-betweener just to get, you know, just to get a foot in the door at Disney. Okay. Yeah. And you in-between on Sleeping Beauty, right? Yeah, I did. Which is, to me, one of the most beautiful Disney animated films, like stunningly gorgeous. Yeah, gorgeous film. And uh, you in between on that, and you eventually ended up getting more responsibility on that film eventually, or or was it primarily in betweening that you did on that? Well, as you when you start out as as uh, a lowly in betweener, and, and believe you me, that is the low job on the totem pole. 
you know, the in-betweener is the, is the last man or woman. Which and, is incredible because it takes yeah. so much skill. Oh, yeah. But but as you move, move up the ladder, more skills are, are uh, required. More skills are eventually acquired as you do the job. So some people find themselves uh, very good at uh, doing a cleanup drawing. Uh, that's why... Mm. The cleanups uh, are done by the key assistant who takes the animator's rough sketches and cleans them up. And uh, that's another whole process of being able to take an animator's rough drawing, being able to keep the energy and spontaneity in that drawing, not lose it, mm -hmm. and yet being able to turn those many, many rough, scratchy lines into one clean, consistent line. So that's another whole skill set all by itself. So these are the things you learn as you do the job. Sure. And you become better at what you do. You become more skilled. And some uh, people actually opted to remain an assistant animator because they enjoyed just doing that kind of work. They enjoyed doing the finished uh, drawing uh, from the animator's rough. Other people wanted to move on into becoming an animator themselves. Okay. They wanted to animate the character. They didn't want to do a cleanup. They wanted to do a uh, rough animation. And so, you know, you, you find what you are good at, what you enjoy doing, and, and you gravitate toward that area, your, your area of interest. And that's kind of the way it worked. You know, you find what you're good at. Some people stayed in animation because they loved it. Others ventured on to do uh, layout or background story uh you know who knows you could once you were in uh hopefully you could uh, find a uh, path upward and get to that job that 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 job you really wanted but it took you a while to get there mm -hmm. and in the old days it wasn't it wasn't fast uh it's five, still not <laughs> well it's a it's a lot faster it's now really wow it, it really is if you aspire to be an animator at the disney studio you were looking at that path toward uh, from lowly in-betweener to full-fledged, uh, you know, uh, veteran animator, you l you're looking at uh, eight to ten years. Wow. It really was, uh, you know, a fairly lengthy uh, path upward. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I have a question. I ask anybody I meet that worked on Sleeping Beauty or had any association with this, I ask this question. I'm sure. not really expecting you to know it because it's kind of random. <laughs> okay. But it has always blown my mind that when Disneyland opened in 1955, the centerpiece of the park is Sleeping Beauty Castle. Correct. Yet yeah. the film didn't come out for another four years. <laughs> and it kind of... Like, talk about having faith in your in yeah. your project. Because we know in this industry, like, in a four-year period, the film could go away. It could never exist, you yeah, know? Right. So I'm curious if there was any discussion upon – I mean, I know it's two totally different things, theme park <laughs> and animation. But was there discussion of why is Walt – you know, why is this castle Sleeping Beauty Castle? Uh, why does it look nothing like our – like, was there ever talk of, hey, let's try and model it after this castle that was built or anything like that that you know of? No, it's really interesting. Uh, there was even a um, a theme park attraction inside Sleeping Beauty's castle. Yeah. I, remember, I remember seeing it. Uh, they kind of recreated it. Yeah, yeah. It, it it went through the the high points of the story, and I remember seeing that at Disneyland. And uh, in recent years, it was actually recreated, and I remember I was invited in by some of the Imagineers to have a look at it because they said, "We know you saw this." Back in 1956 or 57, when it was first uh, when it first opened at Disneyland, and so when they recreated this attraction, they wanted me to have a look at what they had done because many many years had gone past. But it's true, as we were working on Sleeping Beauty, uh, the park had already opened. Sleeping Beauty's castle was already there. Um, I think audiences knew that Walt Disney was working on the film Sleeping Beauty. And it was, it was going to be done one day. And I think uh, maybe audiences just had faith that Walt Disney was going to deliver on his promise. Those of us who were working on the film knew that one day that film would be completed. So it was just a matter of waiting. And maybe that expectation was kind of cool. It was something for audiences you know, and guests to look forward to. Yeah, that's a that's a lot of uh, yeah. confidence you have Indeed. in yourself if you're building your park <laughs> yeah. and you know the centerpiece is something four years out. It's pretty incredible. To but me. it was in production. I mean, yeah. it, 
I mean, we were hard at work making the film. Yeah. Even though I remember uh, Ivan Earl had a lot of his background paintings on exhibit at Disneyland. Wow. In 1955, when the park opened. Yeah, in 55, July 55. Uh, Ivan Earl's paintings from the film were on display at Disneyland, and it was like, this is Walt Disney's upcoming feature film, Sleeping Beauty, that you will see in mm, who knows how many years. <laughs> <laughs> You'll see it one day. But, I mean, we know there were a lot of promises with Disneyland that never happened, like Liberty yeah. Square and Edison Street and all yeah. that stuff. So, I, I don't. it's just unbelievable to me, the, the Sleeping Beauty cast. A lot of there. things were a work in progress. The same way a lot of films are a work in, uh, work in progress. And a lot of films that start don't necessarily always finish. Yeah. So that's that's just the reality of this uh, creative business. A lot of projects, uh, I often tell people, you know, that pe- people have said, oh, you've worked on a lot of uh, Disney feature films. And I said, yeah, and I've worked on a lot that uh, you'll never see. Yeah, yeah. Because they were never made. Oh, yeah. There's so <laughs> much. It's unbelievable. But I yeah. just think if anybody else had created Disneyland, mm-hmm. it would have, no question, been Snow White Castle. It was an already known hit. Yeah. You know, they had a model they could work off of. So I yeah. just love that fact that Sleeping Beauty Castle was there so long before. Oh, yeah. Walt had total total faith and total confidence in yeah. what he was uh, what he was going to do. So there was no doubt that one day there would be a marvelous Disney motion picture called Sleeping Beauty. And so why not build a castle? Yeah. You know. Now, you had mentioned a little earlier that working with the nine old men was really intimidating. But I believe Ward Kimball's the one that maybe you connected with most or learned from most. I love this work. I, I love, uh, of all the nine old men, I love Ward Kimball's work the most because of his, just the sheer, the sheer energy, spontaneity, goofiness. Uh, Ward was my, was my favorite animator. I just loved his, I just loved the zaniness uh, in his work. And uh, uh, Ward was a guy I wanted to emulate. I wanted to be like Ward. Uh, he and Freddie Moore. Uh, Ward and Freddie were a lot alike. Matter of fact, they were good buddies. And so I, I really loved Freddie Moore. Sadly, he had passed away by the time I got to Disney. So I never even had the opportunity to meet Freddie. But I did meet Ward. And I did uh, have the opportunity to assist Ward for a while. Uh, back in the 1960s. Hmm. And uh, he did he was there a favorite character of his that you really loved? No, I loved anything Ward Ward did. Yeah. At the time, we were working on the professor, Professor Ludwig von Drake. Oh, okay, so, cool. So a great character, uh, voiced by Paul Fries. Nice. And the whole, I could go all stories about Paul Fries, who was an amazing uh, voice actor and narrator and and the ghost performer. Host. That ghost host. Yeah. He, Paul had this deep resonant voice way down here but he would also be very up here like professor von drake very up, very, you know so he was he had an incredible range and he was a really cool dude and when paul came to the studio to do recording i would see him out in the hallway by himself and i said hey that's paul freeze he's just standing in the hallway nobody's talking to him so i'd go over and 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 uh, have a conversation with him because I really admired him, and he was very, uh, very gracious, and uh, and we chatted a lot while he was uh, recording Professor Vundrake, and I was working on Professor Ludwig Vundrake uh, in the animation department. That's so, awesome. Yeah, yeah. I, matter of fact, that's one of the things I love doing is meeting the voice actors. If I'm working on a particular character, I love getting to know the actor. I love attending recording sessions. Because to me, it's all it's all part of doing the job. Yeah, you know, I can't I can't see myself uh, working on a particular se- sequence with an actor and not having the opportunity to meet and kind of kind of getting to know that actor. You know, you want you want to kind of get inside their skin. You know, to bring that to bring the character to life. Yeah, when it comes to animation, I mean, there's really two actors. There's yeah. the animator and then the voice actor. And the voice actor, and, right? You right. know, it's the two. Things coming together yeah, to make yeah. that one it's, character. It's, so. it's just a great uh, collaboration yeah. when it works. Yeah. Now, you'd worked in a ton of different departments with Disney, not only animating, but also storyboard artist, layout artist, writer. Yeah. I'm curious, are these areas that you had interest in getting into, or is this one of those things where somebody at Disney saw you had a particular <laughs> skill and was like, hey, you're doing this, whether you like yeah. to or not? Yeah. Well, my first... Uh, my first major change in my career came from the old man himself. Uh, I was working, and and really, I thought I had the best job in the world. I was working uh, assisting Ward Kimball 
and uh, in the animation department downstairs. And uh, Walt Disney was putting together um, a new story team for the Jungle Book because his ace story guy, Bill Pete, had quit. Bill, Bill Pete had gotten into an argument with Walt Disney, got up, you know, abruptly, walked out of the studio, you know, and, and never came back. And so because Walt was still intent on doing the Jungle Book, he said, I'm going to put together a new story crew and let's continue. Let's make this movie. Well, lo and behold, and I never saw this coming, I was one of the guys chosen to be part of the story crew. And I found this out one late Friday afternoon when my boss, Andy England, called me in and said, Floyd, pack up your office. You're moving upstairs to work on the Jungle Book. Now imagine how I felt. I mean, your first question is, what? <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah. Well, first of all, you said, so th this was Walt's decision. Yeah, yeah. Okay. At this point, right. did you even think you were on Walt Disney's radar? Oh, of course not. Okay. Of course not. So, I mean, w w what a compliment. Yeah, yeah. What a kind of, not I don't want to say insult, but aggravation. Yeah, You're yeah. doing what you love, working right. with somebody you love, and then you're like, go do story. And at this point, had you ever even thought, hey, story is something I'm interested in? Yeah. I had a lot of respect for story, but I didn't think I could do it. Okay. So, you know. You hear this all the time. And that's why I was so surprised when I found that's myself crazy. selected to be in the story department and not have anybody say, wait a minute, wait a minute, why Floyd? And then I realized the reason nobody objected, the reason nobody protested, was because that decision was made by Walt Disney. And nobody objects to a Walt Disney decision. Yeah. Walt makes a decision and you say, yes, sir. You know, it, it, there's no discussion. What you know? did you think he saw, though, in you? I have no idea. That's Well, I, maybe to be quite honest, I think what Walt probably saw in me was a sense of humor. Okay. Because I had been doing cartoon gags for some time, but that was just for fun. The reason I did gags was because it was a pastime. It was fun. I did it to entertain myself, and I did it to entertain my friends and colleagues. Well, what had happened was we had this new marvelous invention called the Xerox machine. Mm. So now people could take a silly gag, put it in a Xerox machine, and that gag would end up all over the Walt Disney Studio. And so because my gags were papered all over the studio, unbeknownst to me, guess, <laughs> guess who saw them? Yeah, guess who saw those gags? And uh, clearly Walt said, who's doing this stuff? And somebody said, oh, that kid down in animation. And then Walt said, you know, put him in story. That's kind of awesome. And that's that's how it all happened. It was it was that stupid and that simple. That's awesome. Who's doing these stupid gags? Oh, the kid is. Put him in story. Oh, wow. So done, you done deal. That's how it and that's why there was no objection. That's why there was no discussion. That's why I wasn't even asked. It was not a request. Yeah. Walt Disney didn't make requests. He 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 made demands. Yeah. Hey you, you're in story now. You know, that's it. <laughs> All right, just keep sending the checks. Right? <laughs> that's right. <laughs> so you mentioned Xerox was, you know, fairly new. And correct me if I'm wrong, there's this process called Xerography that I think 101 Dalmatians mm -hmm. was the first feature to use, right? Yeah, we used, we used it extensively on Dalmatians because that was the first feature. Now, keep in mind, we had used it earlier, and a lot of people don't know this, but we had used Xerox on a lot of television things we were doing. But nobody knew about it, okay. and, 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 and it wasn't very high-profile anyway, nor did we make it high-profile because it was just a new tool, a new technology. So when uh, Walt decided to make 101 Dalmatians, uh, Ken Anderson was brought in to be the production designer, and, and Ken blatantly ripped off the British illustrator, uh, Ronald Searle. Searle's work just seemed to fit perfectly the Dalmatian story, which was more a contemporary story, you know, present day London, unlike, you know, the films we had been doing, which were European fairy tales, often set way in the distant past. So here we had Dalmatians, a very current film that needed a um, fresh contemporary style. Uh, Ronald Searle had that in his wonderful drawings and sketches. And so the Disney artist pretty much, with Ronald's permission, uh, basically ripped off his style for 101 Dalmatians, 
which also happened to perfectly fit the new technology of the Xerox process. So, which, which essentially took the original animator's drawings right. and made copies of those. Mm-hmm. So what step was it skipping, essentially? It totally eliminated the uh, step of inking the cells. Okay. We no longer had inkers inking uh, individual cells. Every animator's drawings, and that would include even my drawings, <laughs> even my crummy drawings, would be directly transferred to a sheet of acetate. and then be flipped over and painted on the opposite side. Well, what this did, this gave the animators, for the first time ever, and this was what was significant, for the first time ever you were seeing the animators' drawings on screen because there was no intermediate process. Yeah, There was no one taking the animators' drawing, putting a sheet of acetate over it, and inking over the animators' drawing. Now those very same drawings were seen on screen. So... If you if that was a Milt Call drawing, you're seeing you were seeing Milt Call's drawings on the screen. There was no intermediate step. You were seeing his his pencil lines, you know, replicated on a sheet of acetate, painted and then appearing on screen. So the animators loved it. Yeah, I'll have to admit that the animators loved the Xerox process because what it did it really made them more so the stars of their medium because now audiences could actually see John Lounsbury's. Uh, pencil lines on screen, Milt, Milt's, Frank, Ollie's, their lines, their drawings could actually be seen on screen for the first time. That's pretty cool. So the animator's obviously happy with that. It also speeds up the process. Speeds up the process. So the money people are happy with that. I think, yeah. if I'm remembering correctly, is the one downside is the fact that the transferred lines could only be black, correct? Initially, um, they can only be black. Uh, but in time... Um, as uh, Obi works and his uh, and his marvelous team over in the processing lab, eventually found ways to uh, do the Xerox lines in gray, and we were going to use uh, the gray line for some productions, and then eventually in color, so we could even do the Xerox lines in color. So things were improving as the technology moved forward, but then there was another technology emerging, and that was a digital ink and paint, Mm -hmm. and that changed things yet again. Now, was the first feature for that, was that Rescuers Down Under, do you know, or? Yeah, I I believe Rescuers Down Under was the first time in a feature film that we used the the CAPS Mm -hmm. system, the the, the, uh, computer paint system, was used in Rescuers Down Under. Uh, And then finally, it was used in Beauty and the Beast. Floyd, but, you're, you've been there for every yeah. s- like process. Decades, yeah. That's inc- I know you've written books and such, but have you written just about going from hand-drawn to xerography to digital? I mean, yeah. that's, that's an incredible... Yeah, I was invited by Apple um, to come up to one of their developers' conferences up in San Francisco to speak uh, in front of the Apple developers about the, the technology... Uh, at the Walt Disney Studios that really Walt Disney has always been uh, forefront in technology Mm -hmm. from the 1930s to present day. Uh, There was never a time when Walt wasn't innovating or experimenting or learning and using uh, new technologies. It it was just a natural evolution from the early days, you know, when everything was done by hand to to the the coming of age of... uh, Xerox to eventually uh, painting with computer. And then now today, the entire production pipeline is digital. So, um, and that's been, that's been the process. Over, over decades, Walt Disney has always been experimenting, learning, innovating, and pushing technology as, as, uh, as films have been made. But not only has the studio been doing that, like you did that in the, yeah. in the respect that there are a lot of people who were hand-drawn animators, yeah. and the digital world came, a lot, came around, right. and they were just like, this isn't my art, this isn't what I do, this isn't what I want to do, mm-hmm. I'm not a technological person. Right. And they essentially became unemployed because of it. Very true. Whereas you, was it like an exciting thing for you, or was it more, I, this is a, I have to learn this or else I'm unemployed? <laughs> uh, I knew it was coming. Okay. Uh, you've got to stay ahead. And I believe I was... I think it was in the 1970s where I saw an illustration and I found out that the illustration I was looking at 
was done on a computer. Wow. Wow, in the 70s. In the 70s. Wow. And all I could think was, oh, my God, this is going to change everything. I immediately began to, to study, to learn about, because I, I was not a technologist. I didn't know a darn thing about computers. I began to study programming languages. I began to learn uh, about computer hardware and software. I began to educate myself because I knew this technology would one day totally up in the animation business. I knew it was going to happen. Wow. I knew it was going to happen. When I really saw it taking place was in 1994 when I saw a story reel um, for a little film that was being done up north called Toy Story. And when I saw the story reel <laughs> one day in Glendale, it was, it was early morning in Glendale, and I saw this movie that was in production. It was called Toy Story, done by a little company called Pixar. And I said... It's finally happening. Yeah. It is finally happening. So it took about 20 years. About 20 years, but I knew it was coming. So did it, didn't, it didn't take me by surprise. I knew it was coming. So by the time... You were having to wait for it, essentially. Well, You're like, wait for it, but also prepare myself for it. Yeah. Because I knew that once uh, Pixar made Toy Story, I said, this is going to change everything. Wow. It's going to change everything. And it did. As a matter of fact, so much so that I, uh, in 1997... I um, left Disney and moved up to the Bay Area to work at Pixar. So you did move up there for Toy Story 2. For Toy Story 2. I was actually uh, requested to work on the first Toy Story. Huh. But I had to turn that down because I had just signed a contract with uh, Walt Disney Animation Studios. So I couldn't I couldn't go up to Pixar even though they asked me to come up. So in a way I kind of felt disappointed because I could have been in on the ground floor with the first animated uh, digital film. You still kind of were. I mean, this, I wasn't, still, yeah. this wasn't the fancy Pixar that we have today that you went up to, right? No, this you, was, this was the uh, grungy Pixar yeah. that was in an industrial park of the Bay Area up in uh, Point Richmond. And so eventually I did get up there in 1997. I went up to work on the sequel, Toy Story 2. The direct-to-video. <laughs> which was right? going to be a direct-to-video. Because the, you know, the whole idea was to, hey, we've got all these assets, these digital assets that we've created we can take these same assets and make a new movie and do it on the cheap, do a direct-to-video. Well, when the um, director of the film uh, pitched the, uh, the, the, the storyline to me, I thought, this movie's too good to be a direct-to-video. This should be a feature film, a theatrical feature film. But in any case, I knew I couldn't sell them immediately, so everybody said, oh, no, no, it's direct-to-video, direct-to-video, so that's not going to change. I was on the film for a year, uh, 1997. By the time we got to 1998, Disney had reversed that decision and decided that Toy Story 2 was going to be a theatrical feature film. Hmm. It came as no surprise to me because I knew we were headed in that direction. You seem to be ahead of everything when it comes to these. You have to be. <laughs> and now here we are with Toy Story yeah. 4. It's you unbelievable. Have to be. Yeah, yeah. Crazy. No, I, 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 it was really great to be able to, um, to go up to Pixar that early when the studio was still around 300 people. Mm -hmm. It's got, it's much larger today, but around 300 people back when I went up and we were just, they had just, uh, they were wrapping up Bugs Life and getting ready to, um, we were in production on Toy Story 2, uh, looking toward uh, Monsters Incorporated, which was going to be the, uh, the fourth film. And so it was a very exciting time to be at Pixar. And when it was a little studio, and when we were, and I say we, because I feel like I was part of the Pixar guys, we were challenging Disney. Mm. Uh, the Pixar films were so good. And people often ask me, why were the Pixar films so good? Why were they better than Disney? And I said, well, you know, here's the reason. The Pixar films were Disney films. That's the secret. The Pixar films weren't anything different. They were Disney films, yeah. just using a different technology. It's, you, it's something Disney would have done had the old man been alive. I'm curious. So since you, you really do enjoy the new technology and such, but yeah. do you, is there a part of you that would really love to see another hand-drawn Walt Disney Animation feature? Oh, yeah. 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 And again, it's, it's not a thing of either or. Yeah. Just like, totally. Why can't we have both? Exactly. You know, the, it's, it's not a matter of, you know, oh, hand-drawn rules. This should only be hand-drawn films. No, no. Or CGI rules. We should only make CGI films. No. Why not make both films? Why not choose a film uh, where the story lends itself toward 
uh, uh, hand drawn. Yeah. For the uh, production medium, some films uh, are clearly work better in CGI, and so you would use CG mm -hmm. for that particular film. What I'd like to see is studios making both hand drawn and CGI films, and we've got a, a whole generation of kids who want to do hand drawn films. Yeah. You know, they really love the medium. And, and, and there's no reason why hand-drawn animation has to die, you know, because it's, it is so marvelous all by itself. It doesn't, it can't do what CGI can do and nor can CG do what hand-drawn can do. Yeah. Each medium has its own strength, you know, and, uh, I would love to see the, 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 the main, uh, the mainstream studios do both. I know they won't because CGI films are just, you know, cheaper to make and, uh, the production pipeline's already in place. And, uh, yeah, the, the sad, the sad part of the story is, uh, mainstream studios will probably not make that decision to do both kinds of films because CGI films just turned out to be, uh, they're the money makers. Yeah. They're, they're, they're easy to do in a sense that the production pipeline's already in place. And if you're going to make an animated film, and I have to confess, I've done it myself. There were times when I had to make a choice, should this film be hand-drawn or CGI? Because the production pipeline was already in place, it was just easier to move that film from storyboard into digital production. Uh, that became the default. It'll be uh, what I think is it's going to become the independent film of animation, where like every decade or so, oh, you'll, yeah. you'll see at the Academy Awards yeah. some hand drawn thing. Some hand -drawn you see film. it with the shorts every year. Yeah, there's and, always and hand drawn yet, shorts. And yet, I don't want to see hand drawn animation, you know, become that weird film that's yeah. unique because it's drawn by hand. It, it, it should share the spotlight. Agreed. With, with CG, yeah. you know, both are equally important. You know, you know, one's no greater than the other. They're both excellent, you know, storytelling mediums. So why not, why not use both? Let me ask you this tough question. Is yeah. there a film, let's say in the last decade, that Walt Disney Animation, or any, let's just say any studio, has made that you feel like actually would have benefited from being hand-drawn instead of computer animated? Honestly, and even though the guys uh, over at Disney made a great film and they did Tangled, of course that. That title change still drives me crazy. <laughs> Ta well, Tangle. From it's, Rapunzel? It's mean? Rapunzel. Yeah, yeah. The, the name that's immediately recognizable by everybody. Yeah. Well, I think that the thing was, the story I've heard, yeah. you can correct me, is that boys didn't respond well yeah, to the title yeah. Rapunzel. It, it, so. It's a marketing thing. Yeah. 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 Boys didn't respond well. <laughs> I love marketeers. They come up with the <laughs> goofiest logic. But anyway, I would have loved to have seen... Rapunzel as a hand-drawn film, uh, led, of course, by the great animator Glenn Keane. And his daughter kind of did hand-drawn style-ish stuff she for did, that film, She did right? work on the film, but yeah. if there was ever a film that would celebrate the, the marvelous work of the hand-drawn animator, it would have been Rapunzel. Now, the film was done CGI, and it looks great. Yeah. No, no doubt about that. It's a great-looking film, but what... What fun that film could have been had it been hand drawn. Yeah. There's just, there's a sensibility that hand drawn animation puts on the screen that is gorgeous and marvelous as, you know, as a uh, CG, CG film can give us, you know, that technological prowess. Yeah, it's great. Yeah. But hand drawn just has a, a resonance. It has an emotional resonance. And I think it's because it's drawn by artists. It's drawn by hand. Men and women holding a pencil in their hand, drawing on paper. There's nothing like that. And, and that can't be replicated by any other technology. Yeah, and I think for the audience even, there's something tangible it is. about it's that, tangible. right? You like, I can it. understand, even if I can't yeah. draw like right, these artists, right. I understand the concept of picking up a pencil and paint yeah, yeah. and putting it on paper versus... How it's done on the computer, I think most people yeah. are, are clueless. So it's yeah. kind of just magic. Well, right? for me, it's emotional. And I love to tell this story that I was in one of the Disney buildings one morning, early one morning, and they were showing images on screen. A lot of the images were from CGI films. They were from Pixar films, Disney films. Every image was a CG film done by either Disney or Pixar. All of a sudden, out of nowhere... 
they immediately cut to a hand-drawn classic Disney film. And I felt something mm. inside, like, oh, my God. It just, there was just an emotional connection that hand-drawn immediately. It just grabbed me. All the other stuff was beautiful. It was gorgeous. It was wonder, wonderfully technologically perfect. Yeah. But this hand-drawn film, it just had such emotional resonance. I, I never forgot that moment because it just immediately grabbed me. It touched me. It moved me. And that's what hand-drawn can give you that CGI cannot give you. I love that. Yeah. And that's, you know, that's, for me, that's like when I see a film montage and it'll show a bunch of different clips of stuff. Yeah, and yeah. you go from computer-heavy special effects mm -hmm. to practical effects. Right, right. That's like the gut punch for me where I'm like, yeah. oh, I miss this so much, yeah, you know? Yeah. So that's fascinating. I love that story. That's and the wonderful. fact that the computer can do pretty much anything, yeah. it can do everything and anything, my answer is always, so what? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So what? I look at Pinocchio, and my God, that film is just gorgeous. Even today, how many years, how many decades later, Yeah. Pinocchio is a masterpiece. And not one computer used making that film. Now, I mean, And it, it, it'll live forever. Yeah, Pinocchio is gorgeous. Yeah, it's gorgeous. It'll live forever. And, I, you know, I've, this would be a great question for you. I, I'm curious how you feel as an artist where with computer animation, yeah. I think there was a period of time. I personally think we've, we, we should be past this point at this point, <laughs> yeah. but there's a period of time where it's like, how realistic can we make it look? How realistic can we make that water look like yeah. they just want to test the boundaries of the technology. Oh, yeah. And I think it's been proven. Oh, yeah. You can make anything as real as you want in a computer as an artist. Do yeah. you feel like you're losing some of the artistic nature of it? Because like, Making something look real is very different than putting your artistic spin on something. Yeah, yeah. I, I had a, a small company uh, for a while. Um, Vignette, right? Vignette Films, yeah. a small production company. And one of the cool things was that I, I could do two kinds of films. I could do animation and I could do live action. If I wanted something to look real, I'd shoot it in live action. That's how I feel. Yeah. yeah. If I wanted a cartoon then I was going to draw it. And so, you know, that's the best of both worlds. If, yeah. you, if you want reality, it's there. Yep. All you have to do is photograph it. Yeah. If you want the wonderful, whimsical, fanciful world of animation, then create it. Have artists create that world. Yeah. The whole charm of animation is that it's not real. Yeah. That's what makes it work. It's not real. You want to see real? Go see live action. If you want reality, it's there. It's everywhere. Yeah. So you know? it's frustrating. It, it is. It okay. is. It's very frustrating. Okay. As an old animator who loves this medium, who loves artwork, and I miss artwork today. Mm -hmm. I really do. I miss seeing artwork on the screen. I see technology on the screen, and I'm getting a little tired of it. Yeah. yeah. Just, well, like you yeah. said, I think that the mix would be nice, right? It would be nice, uh, yeah. Because there's nothing against the technology. It's incredible. No, not at all. And I, I again, I embrace the technology. People yeah. think I'm anti-technology. No, I love it. Yeah. I was way ahead of it. That's why I began getting into it when I was when it was back in the seventies. Yeah. When we were twenty years away yeah. from uh you know, from a CGI animated film. Twenty years and I was already looking forward to it. That's unbelievable. Yeah. I hope you enjoyed part one of my interview with Floyd Norman. Part two will be released on next Wednesday's episode of Disney Coast to Coast. But if you'd like to hear part two of the interview right now, head on over to patreon.com slash DisneyCTC. That's right. One of the perks of being a supporter and patron of Disney Coast to Coast is early episode releases. Part two of this interview is available at patreon.com slash DisneyCTC right now. If you've been enjoying the hundreds of Disney Coast to Coast episodes made available to you for free, consider supporting the show at p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash d-i-z-n-e-y-c-t-c and gain access to part two of this exclusive interview with Floyd Norman right now. Other than that, folks, have a magical day. Bye! Thanks for listening to Disney Coast to Coast! Have a magical day! <laughs> Disney Coast to Coast is produced and hosted by Jeff DePauly. Learn more about the podcast and become a supporter at DisneyCoastToCoast.com.